The uh, afternoon session of Gold Standard University Live is uh, about to begin. And um, again, we'll uh, have a 45 minute uh, talk by the professor. But uh, what we'd uh, like to do is start out with Michael's uh, question that he had uh, set off the last uh, um, discussion area about. And uh, Michael, do you have any other questions? Are you satisfied with the answer? Or what do you think? Yeah, I'm satisfied with the answer. We're done. Um, if I can yeah. conclude, what, well, my conclusion yeah. is, um, if you use could you stand up, Michael? Yeah. 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 My, my summary, of my conclusions: if you use the basis as a uh, as an indicator as to timing of purchases, you should be able to acquire. If, if you're acquiring metals over a period of time, you should be able to acquire those metals at a at a lower average price than you otherwise would have been able to achieve if you just. Uh, bought at a regular time. Right. Okay. Is that a fair uh, yeah. statement? Okay. Any anybody else would like to add something to that previous discussion? All right. Well, you yeah. yeah. okay. So I think that's a yes. <laughs> well, could you stand up? <laughs> so just hypothetically, I ask, uh, could you, if you had 100 ounces of gold, use the basis and uh, buy the gold from yourself at, at the spot price, and then do the futures, and Tom had some caveats saying, well, you better be prepared to meet margin. But just to be purely hypothetical, I assure you, what if I had 100 ounces of gold and $100,000? Could I then trade my physical gold and my cash for the offsetting positions to the future market and trade the basis that way? Yeah. That's the topic of the talk I'm going to oh, give right now. Just to introduce you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I don't have a title for this topic, but let's just call it uh, various strategies of using the basis for gold and silver. One of these strategies will be by metallic arbitrage, but I think it's a bigger topic in itself, so I probably will do it tomorrow. I think I have to get out and go to the chair. <coughs> say more about that, but let's just complete the picture. The other one is trading. And uh, most often you would combine the two, but you would keep a separate account for each. In other words, you will start out with an accumulation account and trading at the same time and then you can just plot the profits into the accumulation account as you think that you uh, have reached your limit of 
risk. Obviously, this is more risky, more risky strategy. Now, in addition, I have something that I call dynamic hedging. and various forms of bimetallic arbitrage. <coughs> Which involves both monetary metals, both gold and silver as well. Whereas these earlier strategies involved just one metal at the time, whether it's gold or silver. So we start with this chart, which I already had here in previous session. This is time uh, say days, but you can refine it if you want, especially in a very volatile situation when the market is in turmoil and on the vertical axis you have the basis either gold or silver and we marked off the upper limit of the basis which is the carrying char charge which I'm not going to write here, but remember there is this upper limit and uh, you would like to get as close as possible to the, to the carrying charge, but don't hold your breath, it's not going to happen now after all this uh, trouble in the financial market. I, I, I don't anticipate we shall see a carry in gold from now on, do you? Is it possible that we, the basis will shoot up to reach this carrying charge's uh, upper limit? I think it's possible. It is yeah, possible. I think it's well, possible. all right. So then you can hope. Well, we'll again, maybe unlikely, let's put it that way. No, <laughs> it's not possible. Sir. It's not impossible. Nothing is impossible. All right. Now, you uh, prepare your own chart as we discussed it. We, I don't have to repeat that and you probably end up with something like this. And uh, for the simple accumulation strategy, you are watching for the peaks as a buying signal. You can ignore you can ignore the troughs at this point. This is for the accumulation strategy. As I say, we assume that you have a steady income and every payday you could allocate a certain amount of money for purchases. However, you are not going to buy on payday. You are going to buy, <coughs> you wait for the next opportunity when the basis peaks. After a, a decent time when you build up your history, if you start today, I won't recommend starting purchases the next day. You just wait until you see how your chart unfolds and if you can make sense of it and maybe you want to do a little bit of paper trading, which is you don't actually buy, just assume that if you had bought, how would it work out? And, and, and that could be more irregular, as Tom just suggested. He, he wouldn't be too surprised if there would be a peak touching the carrying charge level. All right, now this is something which we have discussed and there was lots of opportunity to ask questions, so let me go on and discuss trading. This 
trading strategy would involve selling as well. But obviously you would need a larger account because although it's possible to sell uh, in this mid-America exchange, is it called, where the, where the unit, the gold, uh, gold contract. Yeah, the mini contracts. Yeah. Oh, mini yeah. contract. That's uh, which, yeah, which but, exchange? Uh, I think it's the Globex. Globex. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. I guess, 33. Yeah. So say one third of an ounce, which is roughly at one kilogram, is it? Right. Yeah. Right. And then you would use the troughs for signals. <coughs> so for the trading account, you are looking for Selling and buying signals, I use different colors. The troughs, blue, would give you the selling signal in addition to the buying signal, which would work the same way as it did in the accumulation account. So you are buying and selling, and thereby your profit potential is increased. However, this is obviously more risky because of the selling, the, the difficulty or the, the, the danger which you have to realize is that we know there's no lower bound, there's an upper bound which is very good to know that we have this upper bound, but there is no lower bound, so potentially it is possible, I should do it the other way, that the basis, not just that it goes negative, you see here it's contangle, and here it's backwardation. So the basis collapses to negative territory and continue falling, which is a signal that probably the basis has done a permanently negative. In other words, we have a permanent backwardation. And if you are caught short with any sizable position, that's going to be a major loss. So you have to be very careful being on your guard against this possibility of permanent backwardation. Now this doesn't rule out that you can be short, in other words you have sold more than what you have bought, and there is a dip into negative territory. This in itself is not a danger. We have seen that, right, several times. More in the case of silver than in the case of gold. Is that, is that a fair statement? We have seen dips into negative territory. Yes, uh, that's, yeah. That's More, that's it, right. it has happened several times in the case of silver and also in the case of gold, but it was shorter as far as gold. That's me, yeah, in gold there was, I think, a couple spikes. You know, very short Down, spikes, downwards right, yeah. spike. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And and the, as far as silver is concerned. Well, the one example I think, <coughs> think of silver is in 2006 when the uh, Barclays ETF uh -huh. was launched. When it when it had spent you know it spent a couple months I think. Yeah. You know in that negative territory. So. Would you say that it was immediately clear what caused this big drop in the silver basis or? You had you needed a, a fair bit of time before the picture <coughs> clarified itself. Uh, I think it was clear, but what I, I thought was interesting is that the basis actually the backwardation occurred. I thought more on the back end of where it should have because because I know there was a lot of accumulation that was being done before the ETF was launched, but the mm -hmm. sort of the basis didn't really go into full backwardation. Um, until after the launching, when yeah. presumably they had already accumulated a lot of the silver that would be used for it. And, and actually the price of silver started dropping down. 
and that's when it went into backwardation. Uh -huh. Not not not, so not on the way up. <laughs> on the way up. So yeah, so I the, guess that's the, an example of where you know. This, it might you be have a, to a watch for all yeah, these nuances, there. which uh, could be also pretty the ordinary. Unique. I mean, at that at that time, I would have really said, you got this big elephant in the room. That's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not sure the ba basis would have been the number one thing to, you know, to trade based on at that point. At that point? Yeah, because, you know, we're talking about a very large flow of silver in the market. Um, and I think it, that can confound some of these fundamental sort of things that are going yeah. on. I mean, every, you know. yeah. So in other words, to watch open interest is critical if you have this, because uh, this fall of the basis would probably be accompanied with a large contraction in open interest. Is that a fair statement? I think if it was the type of backwardation that has the chance of being permanent. Yeah, I, I'm talking have, about yeah. uh, the basis going into permanent backwardation. Right, exactly. Yes. Okay. So that, okay, so there is an additional indicator to guard against this danger. You don't have to worry about this as far as uh, straight accumulation account. But if you are doing trading, which involves selling, which involves these troughs on the basis chart, then you have to combine, you probably want to add to this chart an open interest chart as well. And if open, well it couldn't be negative, but the scale here, I'm not going into all the details. So the open interest, if it's falling, it could be a confirmation to the signal that we are now in, in permanent backwardation. We are going into permanent backwardation. And prob probably there are all kinds of fancy footwork here. It could be that you are vacillating. Your basis vacillates at the zero level. This could be. And I would anticipate greater volatility. Now, <coughs> volatility would be indicated by the difference between the trough and the, and the ne next uh, peak. Is that, is that a fair statement? That, that these, uh, these differences between adjacent peak and trough would give you an indication of the prevailing volatility in the market. I mean, yeah, when prices are moving greater, there tends to be a little more larger yeah. fluctuations. In the so th this as well. is right. not ironclad, but it, it is a probability. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So uh, you should be prepared for surprises, and one surprise would be. Uh, be prepared, so it shouldn't really be. <laughs> a wide, a, a widening volatility, which would show up in this. You don't have to go back to the price chart. However, keep the price chart handy because that will confirm a lot of signals which you first get from here. But then you need confirmation and go back to the price chart. And the price chart gives you the obvious volatility when you just see these wider amplitudes, ever widening amplitudes. But this would probably spill over to the basis chart and you would, you would also see a widening. But not necessarily. And, and the, the, there is no way to predict what happens when uh, just before the permanent backwardation happens, and I would anticipate a, a, a vacillation between positive and negative territory, maybe uh, ever more frequent, maybe ever wider. But these are things which we cannot predict in advance, but we should be prepared for uh, all kinds of eventuality. So this is the trading strategy. In itself, I would not recommend it by itself, this strategy to even larger uh, accounts, people who are very well healed financially, because I think the name of the game is accumulation.
but if you want to generate more profits, a trading strategy would be a, a good complement to the accumulation strategy. And as I have already suggested, if you are successful, which I hope you will be, uh, generate profits, then set yourself, be, uh, be disciplined. Don't say that, oh, I'm doing very well, so I raise my uh, target of ever larger profits. I think it's, it's safer to set a pre-set a certain profit, which if you reach, then you just plow the excess profit into the accumulation account. Do not use all the marbles and risk, take the maximum risk what you, what you could do with trading. Because you will be exposed to all kinds of surprises. I can, I can promise you that. So, as I say, I always look at this as a complement to the accumulation strategy. And then you work it out. And of course, we all have different risk tolerance. And depending on your risk tolerance, you can just uh, <coughs> uh, uh, combine these two strategies for the best effect. Now, let me invite your questions concerning the trading and also the complementing uh, the accumulation strategy with the trading strategy. Yes? When it oscillates between negative and positive, just before moving into permanent acquisition, would you still take the same um, strategy of buying high and selling low if you're in the, if you were in a trading strategy? I think you could, but the lower you get on this chart, the more caution you should use. Because uh, it, it, these are very treacherous waters. One might even say uncharted waters. Uh, and uh, you don't want to ca be caught on the wrong foot, which is that you have too much short positions. Uh, so I, I would suggest that with a prudent risk strategy, you could do that, but be on your guard. But, that it looks like, okay, we are going to continue like this for a long time, but uh, the market will not tell you that that's actually the end of it, and then you take the big dip, and there's no way for you to cover the short position. You see, even one open short position could wipe out a lot of the profits which you have worked so hard to accumulate on the long side. And that is certainly the most frustrating experience that you've been doing so well. And just because one wrong step, you've lost all, all your gains. So this is the danger. And if you are more risk averse, which I probably would be, uh, I, I, at that time I would say, oh, I'm very happy that I've been doing so well, and from now on, at least until further notice, I will continue the accumulation, but only if this turns back and a basis chart continues at about the zero level. Yes. How best to? Um, Could you stand up for the question again, please? How best to uh, say once you've had an accumulation phase going to protect? Price sensitivities that sometimes occur in the, the gold market. You get swings going down. I mean, if you're in the long haul, I guess in one sense it doesn't make a lot of difference. But if you're in accumulation phase, how best to protect your, uh, yourself from holding on to the accumulation or protecting yourself from, from uh, noticeable price drops? 
What do you think? You Tom, you want to say that? I, mean, I guess one way to look at it is that when you're accumulating, maybe you don't care about the price, you care about the quantity. Uh, or if you truly are accumulating for the purpose of sort of, you know, a wealth strategy, then you care about the quantity. And if you care about the price, then maybe there's some sort of insidious thing working in your brain that says maybe I should be trading instead. <laughs> no, I mean, so I, I don't know what, I mean, you know. A hedging scenario then, or? But if you're hedging, then you're trading. I mean, in, in effect, I mean, because you're 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 picking a point at which you think the price might drop, and by definition, when you hedge, you've you've removed the exposure to the upside. So uh, that's that, in in a strange way, that's still speculation. If your goal is to accumulate, you know, you know, for the for the eventuality of a monetary, you know, gold and silver resurgence. So that's a, that, that, that's probably a different different uh, thing that you would be doing. I might also add that this is not what the grain trader is doing because the grain trader immediately when he buys he so. hedges. In other words, he compensates. He goes short. Uh, you know, in a normal situation, in an extreme situation, he would go to dynamic hedging. But this is so far not hedging you see when you sell here you are reducing uh, an inventory of monetary metals but your strategy doesn't call for hedging okay so we have to separate these two from the next one, which I'm going to explain after this discussion here, where hedging proper is involved. There's no hedging proper involved in this. At least I, I wouldn't look at it that the, these are hedges. I, right. I I mean, that may answer, answer your question actually better when you get to the next section. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so let's see. Yeah, so you might be just about to answer this, but I've written down here um, buying the basis, buying the spot and simultaneously selling futures. Is that different from just the community? So I think there, the difference that we're asking if there's a difference between what we're saying is just accumulating here versus buying not, this spot. Accumulation means just buying Correct. metal, not, not selling futures simultaneously. You've answered your question. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Can we go on? Yeah. Now, there is a ch change of pace here because for the <coughs> first time we introduce hedging, but it's not straight hedging, it's dynamic hedging. In other words, you don't want to hedge everything what you have, all the gold and all the silver. You want to hedge part of it depending on your assessment how the market will continue from here. If you think that we are very very close to the end, and by the end I mean when the basis collapses and we go to per into permanent backwardation, if you think we are very close to that then you lift all the hedges, so you are unhedged. But if the pattern suggested to you that we may still continue this basis in the positive territory <coughs> with threats to collapse, but these would be false uh, signals, and be prepared for false signals because obviously there will be large traders who will set up traps for the bulls and the bears as well, but especially for the bulls, as we know by now, these naked shorts, etc. So if you think that this pattern in the positive territory and the basis positive when we have contangled, if that's what you expect to have, then you will hedge 
part of your inventory. So you have to make a decision, continue and, uh, and uh, adjust this according to market behavior, just how much of your inventory you are prepared to, to hedge. All right, so how does it work out in practice? It's similar to the trading account with the important proviso that you will always have to have more uh, uh, more long legs than short. Let's just call every one of these a long leg. So you have a, like a centipede or millipede with lots of legs. Some of them are long legs, some of them are short legs. But the number of long legs are always greater than the number of short legs. And you, not only that, but you will pair them. You will pair a long leg with a particular short leg, which may not be the next trough, but it could be. And so you number them. Number one, number one number two, and so on, so you pair them. And, be, and that's important because when you lift, uh, you, when you change your dynamic hedge, then you do it, you, you do it simultaneously. So the dynamic hedging strategy is a, is a good one because it gives you potentially as much exposure to the upside as you can have, but you will be able to reap some extra, my, to make some extra mileage by reducing your exposure on, on very short notice. So in other words, this, this dynamic hedging involves trading on the short side more often than here. Here you are, you are very conservative. You, you add the short leg when you are pretty confident that that's the right thing to do. But here you jump in and out. So this is obviously a larger account. Somebody with uh, greater financial, better financial healing, heal, better healed financially, I should say, and, and uh, the dynamic hedging strategy for those who can afford it, and the price is steep, but could be very rewarding. Would you like to add something to this dynamic hedging? Um, no. Or ask questions? I, mean, I suppose that uh, what I would add is that you know this is a very simplified yeah. sort of yeah. way of looking at it, and this is just conceptual. By no means would I, and even for the trading per se, no means would I say that you would actually every time trade each of these ups and downs, um, you you would probably have to apply some sort of filters to it. So I think this is just a conceptual demonstration. Um, sort of as an introduction, not you can run out and actually chart these literally like this and make these trades and profit, as I think you've learned just from doing the simple correlation. The price correlation doesn't work exactly that way. Um, so uh, the idea, though, is that this is a tool beyond looking simply at price. So this could be an overlay on price and be an additional tool that, that I personally, and I, maybe some people might have other, you know, better luck with it, but I personally would use a sort of a uh, uh, either primary with another secondary tool on top of it, or this being the, the secondary tool to, to some other, you know, um, whether it's moving average or something else. Um, I would not necessarily use this just raw like this. Oh, no, this is quite. And also, it's useful to think of this that this is a strategy, a strategy which designed to generate an income. 
So you have gold, and not only that, you are accumulating it because of the uh, whatever you have in mind, insurance, in investment, or other purposes, but you want to derive an income in gold on your gold holdings. And this is what is very much obscured if you look at the internet and the various analysts because they keep talking about naked uh, short positions in gold, naked short positions in silver, and the boys, by boys they mean the, uh, uh, the <laughs> the dealers, they, they set the dealers. The dealers, they set, they set bull traps all over, right. and they want to trick the, the raptors and the okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, T-Rexes, the T-Rexes of we're not gonna of, name names, uh, but of, uh, uh, <laughs> may, may be able to deduce who we're talking Ted about. Ted Butler, yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. all kinds of imaginary creatures from Jerusalem Park yeah. and elsewhere, <laughs> little fairies, elves, what have you, <laughs> will try to trap you, and they trap and. <laughs> And the amazing thing is that they seem to be able to trap even big uh, uh, hedge funds, right, yeah. which are specializing in holding long positions. Good job. So the, uh, the, the, they will be, these hedge funds will be slaughtered by the, uh, uh, the, the, the boys who are very nimble and they go naked. Shot. Well, of course, I don't believe for a moment that the majority of those short positions are naked. I think the majority of those short positions are precisely dynamic hedges. When you pair these, then you have hedged positions, but you also have unhedged positions. And the short legs will, be, will generate the income. And that's what is being ignored by people like Ted Butler and other analysts who are complete, I don't understand that. How could they be so completely blind that there is a very useful strategy? I agree with you, this is just in very broad outlines, but obviously this can be refined and all kinds of additional indicators involved. Uh, by the way, the same applies here, what I already explained there, that open interest is something that you want to watch. All right, so the, you, it will influence, has, it will have an input, input on your dynamic hedging. So here is a strategy, which is a wonderful strategy because it gives you not just insurance, and a solid investment, but it gives you, on the top of it, uh, an income. And of course, the more volatile the market is, the greater that income will be, because I explained that you trade far more on the short side in this strategy than you would <coughs> in the, just the plain trading uh, strategy. So the more volatile the market, the more opportunity you will have to use this dynamic hedging. And there are these analysts who are completely blind to, to dynamic hedging. I, I don't understand that. We have a, we have a question here. Yes. Yeah. Professor, to buy at, the, at your peaks, you haven't got the, the right-hand side of each peak. Here? Yeah. How do you not speak? Along the top of your little up and down, you've got all your here. glide put, no, yeah, up to the left. You know, uh, so you haven't got the right side of each peak. So how do you know it's a peak? Would you, would you use a trend channel or? Uh, sure. All, all. Well, that's why. That's why we said it's. There's a secondary tool you need, right? Oh yeah. There, yeah. there yeah. are what secondary. What do you call tools. a turning point? Your trend and line. Most of them can be borrowed from the chart analysis. This is not a price chart. This is a basis chart. And so, so it's, it's, only, channel on it. it's only uh, 
as a first if it works, that might be one thing. But you know, I haven't seen it work for trend channels per se. But well, if you don't have a trend channel, you could place. If you don't have a trend channel, and you think, ah, this is the top, so your buyback can go up. You don't know. You don't know what's going to happen. No, well, that's why this is a very abstract, very abstract representation. But for example, you can do deviation from a from a moving average. Um, but I think you're, you've got the right idea that that you're right. I mean, you look at this afterwards. Yeah. This is just the raw, the, the basic approach. Yeah. And then there are secondary tools. You, know, you can't decide something is a peak. That's a fundamental is, thing about. This is very true. Yeah. Yet, yet, hundreds and thousands, if not millions, of traders follow various standard techniques, technical indicators, charts, etc., to call something a peak and act on it, knowing that it's really a probability and it will turn out later, whether it was a valid uh, move or it was a mistake. Right. I, th I don't know if you were here, but I was mentioning to a group earlier that the, the most success I've had in, in this if you want to use it as a predictive type thing, is that the, as a turning point. So the, that answers, I think, the question of the peak, that in fact, when you see these things turn, the, the basis moving from, from you know one level to another, you don't usually see these little swiggly things. It makes a turn, and then it moves to the next level, then it makes a turn. So so once you see a turn, you're not necessarily catching the peak, but you're, you're, you're relatively close to it. Um, but even beyond that, I mean, you can you know you can use a moving average, standard 4%. deviation away from it. The four percent is an idea there. You could use some some arbitrary <laughs> number. Uh, you can use uh, um, um, other things. Um, if trend channels work, I've, I've sort of tried trend channels, but if this is a very idealistic representation, this maybe look like it, it would be receptive trend channel. But if you actually chart these things, it doesn't really look like this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It 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 looks more like this. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, which trend do you put? You put one here, you put one. It's even more, you know. So, you can put the, you know. So, it's really the turns and the and the, and the magnitudes of the moves that I think more, more sort of important. Um, you really have to start charting this, mm -hmm. and I think that's maybe why the professor had suggested you don't start trading this right off the bat. You construct these charts. You spend some time, like Michael spent some time. I'm not sure he's. But he hasn't had no, no, it. But he's got four, now you've got four more days of information here that you can take back yeah. and, and add to it. But um, I think you really do have to sort of change the way you, you sort of look at things. But, the, but in fact, it, it, it's, it's a chart, you know. So the same type of tools you use mm -hmm. for a standard chart uh, should work. But um, I'm not, you know, this session is not about this is the particular tool that works here. Uh, that may, maybe we'll have an next one for that. But I have it myself discovered one that works in every single instance. At any rate, I'm sorry, let me just yeah. stay with this. At any rate, if this is too much risk for your risk tolerance, that's not the end of the world because you can shift back and take a more conservative strategy, either pure straightforward accumulation or a cautious trading a combination of accumulation with a trading strategy. But you are quite right. This, this <laughs> is not carved into stone. These signals are not sent from heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> yes. I've been puzzling over what you mentioned about pairing these trades, and particularly that they can be non-sequential. <coughs> can I interpret these uh, short. Ad, shorts here as being possible places where you might short? It's not You're not trying to say that you buy at every peak or short at every trough, but that you use your trading instincts to say, well, I'll buy at this one and I'll pass this one, but I'll buy again here and I'll sell here, but I won't sell again until here. So these are just indications of where you might buy and sell. But if you're taking a dynamic hedging strategy, then for every buy, you also have a sale, even though it may be several 
uh, points, yeah. possible points further down the chart. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Well, I would say what you see there is a downward channel. But <laughs> don't expect that to happen every time. It's just the theory. The theory says that the uh, on on average the base is, is eroding. So with time we have a downward channel. However, in a shorter period you could have a reversal and you could have an upward channel. And once you have an upward channel you will find a green dot and a blue dot at the same height. And that means they cancel out. So in other words, these, as you say, these uh, long and short points are not, they are paired but not sequentially. So the closer, the closer they are, in other words, if they are roughly at the same level, you would pair them because they would simplify your position. You, you can take one look and immediately see what your position is. Those, those paired are hurting you less. Those, uh, those paired at the same level are hurting you less in the adverse case. Whereas those which are wider apart uh, will have to be watched because they could could uh, create uh, losses as we go along. So they're only paired dynamically, okay, depending on the level at which they operate. That's right. Okay, they aren't uh, linked in any kind of decisional way where you say, well, if I sell this, I have to buy that. No, 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 no. That's not the idea. Yeah, but I mean, I, I think. I mean, each decision is made not in reference to what you already have, but in reference to what you should be doing at the time. So we are already in the discussion yes. period. Yeah. Yeah. You're not offsetting, you're trying to create additional exposure in the direction. We just need to have it. Without reference to what you already have. Yes, Judy? Well, could I mention about Ted Butler, please? Uh, mainly, <laughs> <laughs> mainly, he insists there are only four big concentration shots, mm -hmm. not because of dynamic hedging. I mean, it's all theoretical. He said it's not just the amount of short positions, but they concentrated in four major uh, bullion bank type of thing, and therefore he uh, maintained it was just manipulation. And your well, theory of manipulation is to China, but he thinks is that the bullion bank are uh, in collusion or whatever central bank and try to dump silver that way. That, I think, is what my take of his mentioning. Well, uh, you see, I cannot prove my case and he as cannot prove As much as he can't it. prove his. Uh, <laughs> however, uh, it seems to me that to be short on the present, present uh, in the present situation would be extremely foolish, naked short, you see. So I, I just don't see that, 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 that these, these sharp traders, and you give them credit, they are not stupid, they are not suicidal, that they go naked short in such an uncertain situation that we have now, or even what we had, uh, say, a couple of years ago, I think is an unreasonable assumption. So I, I was looking for an explanation. If I'm right in assuming that a naked short position does not in any uh, way justify the risk, I mean the re reward risk ratio is completely missing because the sure you can be lucky but you have to be the the odds are are, are extremely small so if, if I I'm looking at the picture in this way that I have to come to the conclusion and I have and that's what I'm presenting here that the explanation for the very large short position in the gold market and in the silver market is not manipulation but it's dynamic hedging by 
those who do not want the market to, to reveal their identity. It could be governments, could be the Chinese government, could be the government of Israel, which has a accumulation uh, plan to accumulate gold, and uh, these concentration short positions uh, suggest dynamic hedging. That's to my mind. Uh, but I cannot prove it. It's just uh, I'm assuming that uh, people behave more rationally than Ted Butler would assume. I, I want to say something here. A few years ago, um, I was um, I had a uh, just sort of a uh, put a question forth to a very prominent economist about a gold and a, a gold fund. And um, I, I, I informed uh, the professor about it, and he said, well, he's going to be in the United States. We're going to meet and discuss what kind of strategies we would approach. Now, I am in absolute awe of this man's grasp of the market, his intellect, his mathematical ability, and, and equally so, my inability sometimes to understand what he's talking about. So uh, I told Martha, I said, what, do, what should we do? And so our son, he, he went to MIT, he's very intelligent, and so we marshaled all our, you know, we go up to meet him, we have this meeting about, you know, how we would profit if we had this large gold fund of gold, of physical gold. You know, I'm trying to. I, I, I hoped his answer would be so conceptual and so mathematically advanced that I, I wouldn't be able to re replicate or tell anybody else what it was. And we're sitting in this, this place in Phoenix, and I'm waiting. You know, and he's. We're talking about it, and he looks at me, and he goes, "We short it." <laughs> and I just went through the, I mean, you know, for a, a gold guy, you know, I, this is my soul. I, I had no idea what he was going to say, you know, and I, and I told him, I said, we have a large position of physical gold. How would we produce an income of it? He just looked at me and said, we short it. And I just, I just, I, it took me a while to understand why he, you know, why he said this. And he said, well, the ones who are holding gold, this is how they produce an income. They say there's no income on gold. All right, and so you're holding into costs, there's storage costs, there's storage costs. He says there is a way to produce income out of just holding physical gold, and he says this is what we'll do. And so I, I knew when this thing sprang off with Ted Butler that the professor had had already in mind this way that people he believed were who did have huge hold, you know, large holdings of gold would produce the income. So I saw it and I go, well, I don't know what it is either, but I certainly could attest that the, the professor had a had a well honed and thought out idea of why this might be happening. Uh, I, I have to add something to it because I do recall the incident and uh, uh, but I don't want to create the uh, the impression here that I am uh, advocating shorting the futures. It's something else and this is what you I don't blame you because it was a bit technical that you yes. yeah. you well if you missed it or not but you 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 couldn't just reconstruct at this stage because that was quite a few years yeah ago. okay now on the program you see the uh, title here understanding the gold and silver option markets I'm Sorry, but we probably won't be able to cover this the same way. Uh, we might find some time to talk about that. But uh, the, uh, this was earmarked for a two-hour period. We just don't have the time. We are running out of time. So this topic will be dropped. But I have to add to your comments the fact that when I say short, I mean short the call and put options on either gold or silver. In other words, these are short positions and you put them on for the purpose of generating an income because your idea is that you use the shortest possible maturity for say a, a, a gold call option. You, you sell it in the hope that you can keep the option premium. In other words, you're, you're, you are, and this is for the sharpest of the sharp 
traders who are very much with the market. Probably you've got to be on the floor of the exchange to, to do that kind of strategy, but it is possible and I believe it's being done and it's an extremely efficient way of generating an income. I would not recommend it as a... <laughs> as a Please, house. it's Judy. <laughs> It's, it's, uh, it takes more than 100% of presence of mind and uh, stamina and all that. It's, it's difficult but very rewarding and I think that's the way those who generate an income uh, of gold on gold holdings and an income of sil in silver on silver holdings that they are selling they never buy the option, whether it's call or put. They are always selling it, and they sell it with the idea that the option will never move into the money, it will expire out of the money, so it good for very short uh, periods, and, and, and you, you don't always sell, but you wait for an opportunity when you can sell uh, with a fair margin of safety. So uh, I just want to add, because I don't want to be qu quoted that I believe in shorting <laughs> gold, <laughs> it's a, it's I, a, yeah. I don't want to be yeah. quote, quoted. Shorting gold options, yes. Whether it's a coal option or put option, yes. But not shorting uh, <laughs> futures. So with that uh, uh, Proviso, I, <laughs> I support your remark that yes, it is possible to generate. Yes. Um, just two comments. So, uh, first, that first question of yours. I, I remember many, many years ago, yeah. um, maybe it wasn't Ted Butler, but it was certainly others saying, wait until the gold price gets to 400 and then all the shorts will be busted. Out. And, uh, <laughs> yes. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And so, silver to 20 so dollars. Happened, bugger, you know, yeah. I mean, it's went up, but it wasn't this great shoot up to two thousand dollars an ounce. You know, so I think all of those. Whenever I hear those claims, I do sort of think, yeah, but it's been said many times before. We we um, we we have one client who has done actually he's much more sophisticated than that because he does butterfly spreads with options, buys buys options at the same strike with yeah. different maturity, all sorts of strato and all sorts. Yeah, of strato. Much much more complicated. And here, uh, but. Just to note, I mean, we could do an options contract if you want, but you know, you have to buy a minimum 1,000 ounces. Is a minimum, you know, this, cool. the bullion bank guy is not going to do a deal with us <laughs> for percent amount. You know, I mean, this, a, this has nothing to do with Comex. <laughs> but he's made he's made hundreds of thousands of dollars, but he's also lost hundreds of thousands of dollars. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's red. That's high risk. Is very yeah. high risk. What? Uh, um, but he's got the number crunching to work out when the the premium is high or low on the auction related back to the volatility of the price. You know, you've got to watch all this. You'll start looking at your delta and, and yes. Yeah, so you have both put and call options. So, sometimes he buys. Yeah, he would he would buy buy a call and then sell a call, both for different maturities, different, okay. and different strikes. Um, and, how and he uses the premium, like in a lot of cases he would generate a net excess premium. So he would sell an option, he would sell an option at one strike, you know, say at um, $100 above spot and then buy another one at $50 just above spot and he would make a net premium on that. But he'd have an exposure, you know, it depends on what sort of strategy he was putting in place. And how many um, maturities do you have in a calendar year? Uh, well, because it's over the counter market, it's totally customised. So, oh, it's but, he, but I'm saying he would run positions for like 12 months out. Is a serious, uh -huh. serious. You know, yeah. because the premiums when you go out further. But would he sell sh work. very short, say one week? Option. No, not that. Normally not. Well, you see, that's that the side. trick. That's the trick because if you want to use that strategy, which we are talking about, that you are after the very shortest. Now I recall, and perhaps there will be people here who also uh, will remember that at one point, I'm trying to rem remember whether it was in the late 1980s or early 1990s, that 
Comex did have what they called at the time five day options. They gave the name a Monday, a Tuesday, a Wednesday, a Thursday, and a Friday option, which me always meant the expiry. The a Friday option meant, meant uh, the option which will expire the next Friday. But these were really seven day options because Saturday and Sunday were not included. So if you wanted to go out as far into the future as you wanted to, you could make it a seven day option. But they just called it five day options because of the these uh, expiry days were involved. And uh, and for one, one for a reason which I, I I never understood, they took this off the market, and that was just the instrument <laughs> which you needed, <laughs> you needed for, for an income generating strategy. It's probably you, Yeezy, and they, the boys will be losing money. Therefore, they took it off. <laughs> yeah. No Comex. Uh, there is another possible explanation, which is that uh, when this happened, the timing was poor, because that was the time when gold was very much out of favor, and uh, there was not enough interest, not in the instrument, but in gold as such, and silver as such. So gold was in a bear market silver. If they would introduce it today, it would be an entirely different story. And maybe they will. I don't know. I haven't made inquiries. But this would be the instrument if you were looking for a strategy uh, to generate an income. Any other questions? Wow. We have a break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is all right. Um, I guess we could take our break now and uh, be back in 15 minutes or wherever to start the last session of today. Thank okay. you. Okay.